Uh, everybody's looking at the FOMC. How do you think the FOMC is going to look at the reaction on the bond market yesterday from what the RBA in, Aust in Australia did? Yep. It did sort of send some signals, certainly, and perhaps the Bank of Japan should be taking note of this <laughs> even more. Yeah, so I think that the Fed will take notice um, and the fact that the market has almost given them a free kick to be more hawkish and for them to maybe realign their policy um, outcomes with where the market is pricing is the likely outcome. So they will be tapering and there might be a hint that they will bring forward their, their tightening, but that won't be a free kick. I think that the market could react quite negatively to that and we could see US rates um, you know, higher from here uh, following the Fed. OK, so... They may not be using that word that we mentioned before, transitory, uh, yes. certainly here as well. Now, it's really how the economy evolves I mean, in an asynchronous recovery yep. story in the uh, post-pandemic world. Yeah, so talking about inflation, whether it's transitory, for, for us, it's not really now at the level of inflation at the moment, it's the composition of inflation, um, but it's still going to be elevated. So the, the, the previous talker discussed maybe whether it was transitory or not. If you look at what the market's pricing, with five-year break-evens at 3% in the US, inflation, the market is saying inflation is not transitory. And the Fed, I think, will need to react to that. Um, yeah, they talked in August 18 months ago about average inflation targeting. Here we are with inflation slightly higher than anticipated, and they're already backing off. So I think this, this move to tapering and then tightening more quickly than what the Fed was believing that we're going to have to do is, is certainly the course that we're going to run. Brad, it seems like the bond vigilantes are back and what kind of forced the RBA's hand in dropping that yield curve target. How should central banks look at that right now and, and what can they actually do to regain control of the narrative? Well, I think the, the RBA you know, might look back and think that that might have been an error to sort of anchor the April 24 at 10, 10 basis points. And the fundamentals of the Australian economy are actually looking quite robust. Clearly, you know, housing prices are on a surge. Uh, the employment rate is very low. The, the terms of trade that's occurred, you know, Australia's a massive commodity exporter. It's very powerful um, uh, tailwind for the Australian economy. And the savings rate in Australia is very, very high. So coming out of, of the virus, you know, the balance sheets of Australian consumers are very, very strong. So there is some quite strong momentum for the Australian economy. So whilst the market may have overshot in this initial unwind of received positions in the short end, I do think that the, the most likely medium-term path for Australian rates is, is, is higher. And when it comes to, to yield curves, uh, they've been flattening globally. Yep. We saw a little bit of an unwind of that overnight. Is this re-steepening sustainable in any way, Brad? I'll probably push back against that. I think that we, we, we've moved a lot of our, you know, the, 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 the tracking error we have in our portfolios was sort of outright durational being underweight bonds generally, and now we're moving more to positioning for yield curves to, to flatten in various markets. So, no, I don't think that a, a, a significant steepening of the Australian yield curve is, is in order. This coming against this backdrop of a, a country which is facing quite a lot of headwinds now, uh, not least when we look at what happened with uh, the regulatory changes for technology companies and others, and then, of course, the property market and Evergrande. Has this all sullied people's appetite abroad to be investing on the corporate side in Chinese paper? I mean, for yeah. let me just caveat that with the... Because as a dollar bondholder, sure. you yeah. know where, you're, where you stand. Yep. Yeah. The, the, the evidence in terms of flows that, that, that we're seeing and the market is seeing is actually not. Um, it feels to us that you know, there are still inflows into, into bond funds in Asia trying to capture that yield. But you know, we would warn that the, the, the volatility around that China dollar property issuer is, is here to stay. Um, and given that I think it's 40% of the high yield property market is now trading at distressed levels, uh, in, in January alone there's $6.1 billion worth of sort of US dollar China property that is maturing and needs to be refinancing. So funds have not sort of lost AUM in terms of outflows, um, but the stresses is likely to be here to stay. And, and, and as a headwind to the Chinese economy, kind of been surprised that it hasn't been felt more um, at this stage. So at the moment, the contagion from what's happening in the dollar China property market has yet to filter out to the broader economy, but that is a very big risk. And does that make Chinese bonds still attractive then, then Brad? Are they likely to continue its uh, outperformance? Makes them more attractive, actually, yes. Yeah. I'd agree, Yvonne. The, the, you think about what's happening, as we discussed in the previous session, about the general bias for higher yields globally. You know, one large bond market is bucking that trend. If you look at Chinese government bond yields, they've actually rallied 10 to 15 basis points in the last few sessions. And there's potential for that to continue into 2022. So, again, a favoured position of ours for, for many years uh, and continues to be so. I want to just 
change gear and look at Japan. We mm. touched upon it. You saw the RBA abandon their yield control, as it were. Yeah. Japan has to, at some stage, do the same thing. What does that mean for the yen in terms, perhaps, of uh, its value, its effective exchange rate, if you will do? We're very cheap here compared to, his, historically speaking, here. And also, what does it mean for a bond investor? And when yeah, yeah. do you see them doing this? Yeah, it, yeah. so Japan's kind of, there's so much going on in other markets that you know, Japan is just sitting there not, not doing much. There's been some political change, but not much market change. But yes, if you look at the Japanese yen on its real effective exchange rate, it's actually now at a very, very cheap historical level. Um, and whilst, again, all bond yields are rising, the Japanese government bond yield is not. And the interest rate differential on the weaker yen, it could, into 2022, be a, a market that investors are not focusing on, but it could actually create some more volatility if the BOJ has to also start to unwind some of the significant unconventional policy that it's been... It's been I mean, what does it mean for the yen, for instance? The, if, the, if the BOJ was to taper, then I suspect that the, the yen would be stronger. Uh, so there's potential support for the yen into 22 if this, if this was to, to transpire. And what does this mean just globally then, Brad? You know, is, is outcome-based guidance no longer a viable strategy for central banks? Well, yeah, central banks did what they had to do to tackle either the global financial crisis or now more the, the virus in, in more recent years. But all these unconventional policies, if the economy is returned to more normal activities, has to be unwound. Um, for large central banks like the Fed, they, they, they've done it once or twice before. So for smaller central banks like the RBA, we're seeing what happens there when it's their first time. And let's not forget markets like Indonesia, Bank Indonesia, you know, significantly you know, purchaser of, of Indonesian government bonds, if they have to unwind, there's potential volatility in a range of markets. So as active investors, we need to consider where to place our chips and try to avoid those potential uh, periods of volatility. OK, and where do you avoid then at the moment, Brad? Um, again, I think the, the, the short end of the Australian curve is still going to be to be volatile, so we'd be underweight there for the time being, unlike potentially the New Zealand um, short end or the Korean short end, where we think that may, maybe markets are fully priced for, for cycles there. Um, the short end of Indonesia, um, uh, uh, avoiding uh, underweight uh, in, in the US, given our, our views on, on, on Fed. Uh, so, yeah, there's a, there's a few um, positions there.